Welcome to the Raising Cinephiles podcast, a show about passing on your love of cinema to the next generation. I'm your host, Jessica Cantor, and I have worked in all facets of the entertainment industry for the last 20 years, and recently became a mom. This week, we welcome Greg Longstreet, who is a publicist at DDAPR, and he's a champion of some of my favorite filmmakers. He discusses how he really loved sharing the films he was working on with his daughter, and how it's come full circle now that his daughter works in the industry and shares the films she's working on with him. Always remember that myself and guests are speaking from personal experience, not giving parenting advice. Let's go ahead and dive into the episode. Hello and welcome back to the Raising Cinephiles podcast. This is Jessica Cantor, your host, and I am here today with Greg Longstreet, a publicist at DDA PR. He is a third generation showbiz brat. He represents as a publicist some of the top filmmakers of today, and he is a true lover of cinema. So I am very excited to get into this conversation. Welcome, Greg. Great to be here. We'll kick off with my first question. What is your first movie memory? It's a hard one because I think we ingest art different ways as we get older. So there's a lot of like snapshot memories of film. I definitely recall my parents taking me to a screening of Fantasia and it freaking me out. But I all I remember is that really like monstrous demon on the mountain. And it's so things I that's definitely one of the earliest ones, but I don't I couldn't I don't necessarily remember the film itself. I just remember being impacted by it. So I don't know what year that was, but I definitely re- recall it. Yeah. And what movie do you remember seeing in full? It could be at home from VHS. Yeah. It's interesting because so I was born in 1969. So you're talking like growing up in the 70s and 80s. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm a third generation show business brat. So I say that kind of jokingly, but it's true. Like my parents, my dad and my stepmom wrote and produced in TV. My grandfather was a novelist and a screenwriter. So I grew up in LA. So it's always been around me to some degree. And so it was just, just there. It was, and as opposed to like today, wherever you can stream stuff and see movies and take stuff in anywhere, the seventies, like was, you had to go to the movie theater to see pretty much anything. But the caveat to that was something in LA called the Z channel. If you go to Amazon prime, you can find a documentary called Z channel, a magnificent obsession. And Z channel was like the first cable we had here. And it was very much like having an art house theater in your home. And each month they would send you this magazine that would show all the movies playing that month on Z Channel. And these were like, again, there were films I took in as snapshots. And so I was aware of them, but I didn't probably see a lot of them until a lot later. But they would show stuff like Taxi Driver and Heaven's Gate and Deliverance. So I remember just being impacted by the images of these films, not necessarily seeing them yet. As I, the first films I really took in the 70s, though, in movie theaters that I recall enjoying, there was a period of time that Disney produced these live action movies in the 60s and 70s. So I came in like in the 70s era of that. So you're talking like Apple Dumpling Gang, Freaky Friday, The Cat from Outer Space. Pete's Dragon was a big one. These were like, I remember going and like loving these movies. I think the 70s version of what Amblin films became in the 80s. If, which one came first? If I went by year, I'm guessing like Apple Dumpling Gang, because that was 1975 as one that really impacted me. But then also, I remember my dad in 1976 bribing me to go see Rocky. I mean, I'm like seven years old and I'm like, I don't want to see a movie about a boxer. And he like told me he would give me a dollar if I didn't like it. And did you get the dollar? I think I did just to be a dick. <laughs> I think I was like, I don't like that movie. It's a great movie. It's brilliant. But I don't think I necessarily appreciated it back then. And I think this will be a good point of conversation because if you talk about what to show your what to show your kid and it and I've definitely fallen victim to it too, like being really excited to show my daughter something and it falling flat on its face. So for me, it was really discovering movies like Apple Dumpling Game. Bad News Bears was huge for me. And that was like 1976, Bugsy Malone. So these sort of mid 70s, I guess I was probably six or seven, were the, was really when I was taking in film and like enjoying the experience of going to the theater and watching these movies. Yeah, from my research developmentally, I think that's when someone can take in a narrative that's over yeah. an hour long like five years old though so far almost everyone i've spoken to talks about their parents taking them to see a movie inappropriately young two or three years old to the theater and i'm sure 
I'll do it in some way. <laughs> two or three years old, what are they, what are you really taking in at two or three? I do remember like going to see Animal House in 78 and there's nudity in that film. And there's, is that, is nine years old too young to be, for a kid to be seeing boobs on the big screen? I don't know, but I definitely remember it. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's different now because of the amount of media and the amount of screens and to go see a movie there was more intention behind the action which leads me to my next yeah. question did you have family rituals around seeing movies only in that so i remember my parents got divorced in the mid 70s and my mom we moved into a condo in malibu and i know that sounds cooler than it is because it was very rural back then but there was one movie theater in malibu and i remember they would show i want to say it was two films and Every week or two, I want to say it was weekly or bi-weekly, I can't recall, they would switch the movie like that Thursday or Friday. So you're locked out there. You weren't going into Westwood or Santa Monica much back then when we were really young. So whatever was coming into the theater, we would just end up going to see. So I'm guessing like the idea that I remember you would call on the phone to see what film was going to be playing. There was a time where the outgoing message would change over to the new movie. Come to see my plane tomorrow night at eight o'clock. And I just remember always being excited to find out what the new movie was going to be. And it was usually, again, they weren't always the, probably the most appropriate films. I, I know there was a point where like we would drive into Westwood because that was a very much different than it is today. Westwood was like a hub of movie theaters. There was a good one, two, three, four, five. I want to say six to eight movie theaters just in Westwood alone showing different movies and that became a real big kind of go-to spot outside of Malibu to see films as well. So it does get a little fuzzy. I definitely remember where which theaters like I saw Back to the Future in or I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark in. But other than that, like when you get into more, I don't know, films like 10 with Dudley Moore or Saturday Night Fever or these just or Animal House. I can't necessarily remember the theater I saw it in, but I just know. Obviously, I was taken to a lot of movies. So clearly, there was a ritual to it in some degree. And I loved going. So I think for me, it was about escapism as I got older. So anyway, I, yeah, I don't want to feel like I'm going to ramble a little bit now in terms of what movies meant to me. And I think it'll, once we start talking more about our kids, it'll apply more. But yeah, it definitely was a thing to go to the movies. And I clearly at a young age was into it. Yeah. And did you have conversations about the films with your family? No, I don't want to say that kind of like very like sure of myself, but I don't recall having like having, hey, let's talk about this movie or what did, what did you take away from that film? I remember my mom and my stepdad like really wanting to show me and my sisters like Harold and Maude. Or Where's Papa, like these classic Hal Ashby films. And they were, and I remember enjoying them, but there was no discussion about it. It was just like, they wanted us to see what they loved, some of the stuff that they loved. And my dad with Rocky, it was like, for them, it was like these. So I don't remember really having film conversations. I don't think that's what, being a cinephile partly is the self-discovery of it. Yeah, I had dinner with my mom the other night and I was like, she was like, remember we used to watch beaches together and cry? And I was like, I must have been like <laughs> seven, eight years old. And I was like, yeah. I was like, did you ever contextualize the death and cancer for me as a young child? And she's like, no. <laughs> oh, let me ask you so, a question though. Okay, so for that's a good example because with beaches, did you feel like your participation in the viewing of that was more about connecting with your mom? Because I think part of it with our children, and I think we see this nowadays too, it's like, I at least, it's almost like a pet peeve because I see like parents, like they make their kids like Star Wars in a way. Like they really, like they're dragging them to Comic-Con and they're dressing up their kid. Mm -hmm. And to me, kids are like, I just want to connect with my parents. So I'm going to like what they like. So I think with great power comes great responsibility. And I think it can be wielded for a source of good as much as it can maybe be wielded for a sort of bad result. So that's, I guess my question to you then is with Beaches, do you think that was more about connecting with your mom or did you really love the movie or could you take in what was happening even with it? I love a good cry. Always have. And uh -huh. I think that might have been the beginning of it. I used to remember in like my 20s when I was an assistant in the industry and was just having a rough time. 
I would watch Grey's Anatomy every week for that cry. And <laughs> like, I remember in college, I would watch Love Story for the same feeling that Beaches gave me, you know, the same cry, yeah. like the same tragic thing that was outside of myself. And it was a safe place to just let my emotions out. And so I think yeah. that might have been what I shared with my mom in those moments. And it was safe to go there because she was with me when I was young. So maybe it's a combination of both. Yeah. Because- no, it's great when you have that kind of, I think that's what's also great about being a lover of films is it can be so therapeutic like that. Like mm-hmm. Magnolia is that movie for me, or definitely was for a period of time where I was doing a lot of work internally. And for whatever reason, that movie just brought it all out for me, mm-hmm. whether it's issues of fathers and sons, and I could go to that movie and it could take me to that place where I could just process whatever it was I needed to process. Yeah. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to back up a little bit to like your middle high school age. Did you go to movies with friends? Was that part of your social experience? Yeah. And actually I'll back up even a teeny bit more because I'm trying to, what age are you, what age is 13? It's like middle school, right? Almost high school. Okay. So because I know part of this show is about the movie that really turned, turns the dial for you. And definitely I have to give a shout out to E.T., because E.T. was the first movie I think I became obsessed with. So I just had to throw that in there. And I think, but that also plays into the relationship with my friends in middle school and high school. Because I think we all, I found my group in Malibu that were, I was friends with this kid, Barry Warnick, whose dad was in the industry, still is. And he had the eight millimeter camera. So we were always like, that's like when you started, it's almost like the Fableman. So you just start making movies with your friends. But E.T. was that film, I think, that really turned the dial for me. And I remember having trading cards. And I had Neil Diamond put out a song called Heart Light, which was about the movie. And I remember dancing with my mom at my bar mitzvah to that song. Aww. And going to Universal Studios had this activation. This, so I was that was really the movie that made me love films. And then to the question you just asked, throughout junior high, Less so high school, but ju- middle school, junior high was really like that era of Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Ghostbusters, John Hughes. I remember seeing 16 Candles for the first time. Like I got, I won tickets on the radio to a screening and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And that was like my first John Hughes film. Or maybe not. I don't, when was vac- Vacation technically is a John Hughes film because he wrote it. He didn't direct it. Oh. But 16 Candles. was So yeah, my friends, that was a big part was like talking film with them. I remember being at summer camp and someone spoiling the moment in Raiders of the Lost Ark when the big guy with the sword, when Harrison Ford just pulls out the gun and shoots the... Do you remember the scene? So like he encounters this guy with a big sword doing all these like mm-hmm. tricks And then Harrison Ford just pulls out a gun and shoots him. And it's like this amazing, hilarious cinema moment. And I just remember being at summer camp and someone ruining that. (laughs) So it was like this best part of the film and like someone like a total, like spoilers before they were called spoilers. Yeah. So it was very much part of that. Because again, I think I was, I didn't have, I think as a result of a, a dysfunctional childhood with divorce and all that stuff, my comfort was movies and it allowed me to escape. And, and the friends I rolled with were all about movies too, for sure. Also, as a child of divorce, found that in those years, movies definitely gave me that escapism, the feelings, a safe place to explore, and the way to connect with other kids. But the, all the movies that you're saying, I, I definitely watched through my high school years, even though I also had like Clueless and some new newer teen movies but yeah. I'm missing the teen movies today. Was there a difference? Like you talked about like beaches with your, about your mom and beaches. What was the difference in terms of movie taste with your mom and your dad? The movies that your dad liked versus the movies your mom liked? I never watched movies with my dad. Okay. He just wasn't into that. He was more into music and it was just not his thing. I don't have any, I do have this one memory right after they told us they were getting divorced. And we went to see, my mom took me and a, one of my friends to see When a Man Loves a Woman, the Meg Ryan movie where she played Andy Garcia, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. And I cry. And, and I don't know what she, when she fell through the glass in the shower and I started crying and I guess the divorce and I just was crying so hysterically. My mom had to take me out of the theater. 
Aww. And so I like distinctly remember that moment. I definitely was more something I did with my mom. My mom was, my dad was a little bit more a traditional dad, like a provider, tuck me into bed sometimes, but I had more right. of my childhood experiences with my mom. Yeah, but you said your dad liked music. So again, I'm big on both, actually. Like, if this podcast was about raising music files, whatever the word is mm-hmm. for a music fan, I'd have just as much to say because I feel like art lives under one roof. Mm-hmm. It just depends what room you want to hang out in for, at that moment. So maybe your dad, yeah. I don't know, was there a band your dad turned you on to not to shift topics for a second? Yeah, my brother's a musician. I wasn't as musically talented. I was a, I did, I danced Okay. pretty like intensely through high school. So I do think both of them exposed me to the arts. And I do feel like there's a world where if this podcast takes off, there's raising music lovers and raising foodies and raising anything that is a way to pass on your love of the world to your children and open their senses to different cultures and experiences. And I think that's, as you said, art does that. It's about exploring the human condition, right? Yeah. I think because with my daughter, especially like that, movies is a massive part of it. And she works in the industry now. It's, but it's like, it definitely wasn't just that it was that was especially when you come from a family of divorce mom is mom and whether you're a daughter or a son like that connection is very strong and as a father especially with a daughter i think you're you try to figure out what your place is and i think what obviously i'm a source of i'm always there for my daughter but i think what i did for her more than anything was expose her to all these great things and then let her find her way in into what she gravitates towards which we'll obviously get into further down this conversation but yeah that is a big connector for me and my daughter is just film music comedy all this all these Mm -hmm. things but definitely film is probably number one i'm gonna one more question before we transition into discussing your daughter and this might be different for an la born and bred person what film what moment did you realize you wanted to work in the industry it's why i listened to some of your past episodes and i know it's hard because like my mom threw me in an acting class when i was like 11 years old so i think acting was definitely a path that i was looking at doing and even like my late teen years would go on auditions and so i knew i think i always knew that this was like it's like the family business and not that I felt I had to do it. I just, I'm a lover of all of it too much. I grew up around sets being on mm-hmm. set. I remember like spending an incredible summer in New York with my dad and my stepmom when they were producing the TV show fame and being on set that senior year of high school and just being in that universe was great. I didn't know necessarily what my role would be, but I think I always knew it was just in the fabric of who I was that I'm going to be doing something in this world. And if you look at my LinkedIn page, I, even though I've been a publicist for close to 20 years, I spent five years as a working screenwriter. I worked in I, I worked in production as a set PA. And I, so I've, I've always knew there was no like moment. I, it's funny. It's a great question because it's something that I do envy of other people who aren't from LA or aren't, weren't grown, didn't grow up around it because I always love that story of the person who like, oh, I was living in Milwaukee and I just knew I wanted to, and they saw a movie that made them want to travel West. And I, yeah, it's a very specific experience. It's not something that I ever got to experience because I think it, I never really was given a choice in some ways. It was just as what it is. Maybe I'll reframe the question for you is how did you discover or land on being a publicist? That's just like finding my place in the world of entertainment. I think when I, So I was in 1998, I sold my first screenplay. And so I went down that road a little bit and sold. I ended up selling two feature films that didn't get made, but I was able to make a living at it for a time. And then I just got to a place where about four or five years into it, and I wasn't attracted to the struggle of being a writer. I'd seen my parents go through like the ups and downs of it. They had a great, they had great careers, but there's always those kind of ebb and flow. And it was more important for me to raise a kid in a secure environment. And so I wanted to still find my place with something that had a little more financial stability to it. At that point, I was a little too old to become like an agent or manager and had a friend who was a big publicist. I was like, you know what? I'd probably be really good at this. And then I just learned it from the ground up. And then specifically with filmmakers, because that's like my area, that's my main area of focus of PR or directors. And it was really interesting how I found like my early, like my young adulthood 
exposure to reading screenplays and stuff led to my first client. I remember reading Shane Black's script for The Last Boy Scout, which is an incredible screenplay. Mm -hmm. And then when I was looking to sign my first client, I was like, oh, I wonder if Shane Black has a publicist. And he didn't. And he had Kiss Kiss Bang coming out. So that led me to seek him out as a client. And I got lucky enough to sign him. And then from working with him, I was in London with him and I ended up meeting Edgar Wright and who one of today's great filmmakers. So it just all evolved organically. And I, I consider myself so fortunate to get to work with some incredible artists. I just this past year, I started working with Christopher Landon, who's Michael Landon's son, who does horror films. And I work with Bobby Farrelly, who's one of my heroes. Dumb and Dumber was such a huge movie for me. Dumb and Dumber is the reason I wrote my first screenplay that I ended up selling, starting a career with. So to get to be his publicist and help bring attention to his work, it just a career in show business doesn't have to look any specific way. It just evolves into what it is. And yeah, this is where I'm at right now. Who knows what, check in with me in two years and see where I'm at. What was the film that made you, like, like I was saying, like that film that made you want, that drove you to want to do it? The film that really stuck with me a lot, there was a couple, but one was Bertolucci Stealing Beauty. I really Whoa. identified with Liv Tyler's character. I watched it in high school. I thought I was going to be a ballerina. I wasn't applying to colleges my senior year until I got injured. And I just loved that film. And then when I went to NYU and started taking some cinema studies classes, the one that really opened my eyes to the craft was Cleo from 5 to 7, Agnes Varde's film. Mm-hmm. It's about a woman who discovers she's dying in two hours and like what she does with her life. And it's chaotic French new wave. And that when she finds out, she goes down the stairs and the way it's filmed, it's almost as if she and the staircase are dancing. And it just, the, the way it was shot and edited it all of a sudden I was like, Oh, there's a craft. There's craft. That yeah. was that like moment when I was like, Oh, cinema is a craft. But I was rather late. And when most of the people I talked to are like, yeah, in high school, I picked up a camera. I was like, no, that was for me like way later. I was like probably 20. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Now let's fast forward. Do you remember the first movie you showed your daughter? Again, I think it's a tough question to frame it so like direct like that, because when you're raising them, it just evolves into like you're especially now with like iPads and computers and satellite you had direct tv so it's videos like baby einstein and which evolves into other things which rolls into other things i didn't really have it set i want to turn my daughter into a cinephile so here's what i need to do whether it's playing a lot of music around the house or definitely showing care in what we showed that the gateway drug of disney whether it's pixar things like that that just becomes part of your hey here's what we're doing today the ceremony of we're going to go and we're going to sit. Probably have to talk to my ex-wife, who I'm good friends with still. And she might remember like the actual movie we saw. I definitely have a recollection of intentionally wanting to expose her. and it, You know what I mean? And again, I think it was like the same sort of age for me, like being able to ingest the narrative thing that you were talking about. And I think that's when I really started to be conscious of it. Before that, I think it was more about raising kids. And being responsible and what they did see and didn't see and not taking it too seriously during those years. And with anything too, it's kids instinct is to push back or rebel or have their own voice. So you want to be careful with how much you're pushing stuff on them. You really want to feel organic and natural and have them be excited for these experiences. So for me, that really came about through my job and exposing her to what I was doing through work. And I think the earliest memory of that is probably like, so she was born in 98. So 2007 would make her what, like nine, maybe I can, if I'm doing my- I'm really bad at math. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm really bad at math. I took her to New York with me for, I was working on a, a Nick Cage movie called Ghost Rider because mm-hmm. the firm I was working at the time had a client in it. So I was like, oh, it'll be fun to take my daughter to New York. She came with me. And so she was with me through like, you know, had some press, some work stuff to do. But then I took her to the premiere and then we went to the party after. And I remember because she was just getting into like dancing and stuff. And she was break dancing at the party. Not real break dancing, but like a nine-year-old version of break dancing. So it just made her comfortable in the space of film and the industry. So yeah, the movie Ghost Rider 2007 was like my first sort of, okay, you're going to come see what dad does and see what you think of it. You know what I mean? 
And then following that, it was 2010 when Scott Pilgrim versus the world came out. And I was working on that movie with Edgar and there was a lot of events and things. And so I would bring her along to just be party to it and experience it. And I think that definitely got things moving. She definitely has that moment for her that turned the dial. Like, again, it wasn't anything that I did. It was like opening the doors to the house of art and letting her find her way because I had no idea what the thing was going to be that would flip her switch. It ended up being The Shining of all wow. movies. It was amazing. And again, I was like, I had her around it all. And then I remember it was in 2013, we were going to go to the Kubrick exhibit at LACMA. I was going to take her to that. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, I want to show you The Shining before we do that. And at that point, 2013, she's what, 14, 15, maybe. And that, I think, is what, and once she saw The Shining and then saw the exhibit and all the props, she became obsessed with that movie. And we love talking about it. We love talking about all the conspiracies about it. So that was really the, everything else before that came before that was just exposing them to it. Not trying to force it, not trying to make them like something. It's just giving them the keys to the kingdom. Can we talk a little bit about horror and kids? Because I love horror, sure. but I did not develop. So does she. I did not develop my taste. Like my parents actually thought I wouldn't handle it. So I didn't really experience it until I was in college and then older and then really yeah. love it. I think it's an auteur's genre. It's so great. I love horror. Yeah. It's bold showing a 15-year-old The Shining. It is, but I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think she could handle it. I remember mm-hmm. seeing... I don't think I was even 10 years old yet when I saw, it was, it was 1980. It was like on the Z channel, what I mentioned before, it's called Terror Train. And I remember mm. being so scared by Terror Train. Like I was opening doors in the house. And when you're 15 though, I guess at that point, I just felt she was knowledgeable enough, you know, of what's real, what's not. It's all make-believe. It's on the screen. I felt she could handle it, I guess. I guess I have to go back and ask myself at 2013 what were you thinking but yeah I mean I'm curious because I do think it's all about the kid and like what the cues were like that you felt she could handle mature content and you felt comfortable that if she was uncomfortable she would just tell you and you'd turn it off yeah and probably even before that and I can't tell you 100% but I'm sure there were movies that had scary elements look at Twilight like I had taken her to the, she was a huge Twilight fan and Harry Potter and stuff. And those all had dark elements to it already. So those kind of films slowly indoctrinate you maybe into wanting to discover and investigate darker topics. And I guess maybe it was films like that. Oh, she can handle vampires and werewolves. And even though it's got this undertone to all of it, I clearly felt at that age, she couldn't. It's the funny thing about The Shining is I remember seeing that trailer when it came out. I think it was in 1979 that trailer came out, and it was basically, if you remember that trailer, it was just the shot of the elevators. And the trailer is when it, it opens up and all the blood pours out, and it floods the room. And all the fr- I remember being a kid watching that and left the theater. I was so scared. And this is again, so I wasn't even ten. I was just ten years old. So clearly, I couldn't yeah. handle that. I couldn't handle horror at 10. But Mm -hmm. as I got older, Nightmare on Elm Street, Dead Zone, Christine, The Thing. Like, so I think it's an, it's definitely an age thing where maybe you have a better ability to separate reality from fantasy or what's make believe. And so maybe that's a good, that's a good indicator of when you should show your kid horror. (laughs) Yeah. I think Scream was my gateway horror. That's a good one. Cause it was teeny and light, but it wasn't. A slasher film. Yeah, yeah. Scream was cool because that sort of made fun of the, it. It definitely was, it, it was almost like not parody, but it definitely took the piss out of the genre a little bit. Yeah, and it made me want to explore the genre because of how how they made fun of it. You know? Yeah, it, it made it safe. It's, oh, I can live in this universe and it won't hurt me. It's all, they're all in on the joke in yeah. a way of what it is. Oddly yeah. enough, my daughter works on the Scream franchises now at Paramount. She works in digital marketing now, so she got to work on the last two Scream movies. Oh, that's great. (laughs) And do you know, so we're talking about horror and that she likes horror, but when did you have a sense of her taste? I know what I think she'll like. And it's funny because last night for Father's Day, we went and saw There Will Be Blood at the Alamo Draft House, which is one of Paul Thomas Anderson's best films. And 
I did. I'm like, I want to share this movie with her because she hadn't seen it. But I, part of me knew that she'll probably think it's okay. Like, it's not her kind of movie. Like, she appreciated the mm-hmm. artwork behind it. But it definitely wasn't like she's a 24 year old. So it's not necessarily the kind of film she gravitates towards. She loves mm-hmm. Pulp Fiction and she loves like anything Quentin Tarantino and that kind of stuff. You know, we went and saw Megan at the theater not that long ago and had the best time. We both, I remember us both going to see La La Land and both disliking it. Like, I remember like looking at her and she looked at me and like, we're both kind of like, this is kind of terrible, right? It just happens organically and you're not always going to be right. I remember showing her Die Hard and her being like, eh. And I was like, what are you talking about? Die Hard is the best movie ever. So I think it's just about embracing all of it, the failures and the successes with it. I think sharing the experience of, and even if you don't, even if she doesn't like something I've shared with her, it's connecting on the fact that you have that difference. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you talk? You can debate it almost a little bit with yeah. that. Has she introduced you to anything you wouldn't have seen that you liked? Movie wise? Yeah. It could be TV too. I'll answer it this way. I've the same pleasure that I get out of introducing her to or showing or sharing a film with her. Cause she's now at a place where she'll see certain films before I get to see them because of her job. And mm-hmm. so her being like, because she worked on Top Gun Maverick as part of her job at Paramount. And so she was really excited to take all of us to go see it. And even though it's a movie I would have seen anyways, the fact that it was like her, I think that kind of answers that better. It's yeah. like watching her get the pleasure out of, I'm going to share this experience with you. So the movies that she's working on now, I think the same pleasure I got out of sharing the movies I worked on with her, it's fun to see that now with her with me because she's she's getting that advance treatment on certain films yeah and i'm curious what the culture was for her and her friends watching movies as a teenager in, I think, in los angeles i'm like specifically yeah. this is a personal question i'm like what is it going to be like for my kid in la yeah, i remember it was all like high school musical twilight harry potter these were just, it was, it's, it's such a different, that's the thing is you have to remember, Jessica, it's like our childhood is not their childhood. And it's mm-hmm. like their experience, it's already so different. If you look at social media and TikTok and the way, like I was excited to see the new Flash movie, but once I went on TikTok, like every cool scene, someone's filmed the screen at the movie theater and posted all the, and I think the experience of movie going is a hard one to pin down of what that is for kids but I think you can what you can do is partly what I did which was the ceremony of it all so like I Mm -hmm. would at a certain I remember at a certain age I think it was like in 2014 like I started taking her to the new Beverly where they screen like old movies and stuff like they put out that schedule and if I see a movie that's really cool like even today I still do it I took her to see Taxi Driver earlier in the year with my girlfriend because she had never seen it and I'm like I want we went to the new Beverly which is Quentin Tarantino's theater. That same year, I started taking her to the Senespia screenings at Hollywood mm-hmm. Forever Cemetery. And again, these are like, you picnic. It's like an event. I remember I was going to see Jaws, I think was the first one. That's, by the way, one of, I think one of my number one films. It's a perfect movie. But I remember taking her to see Jaws at, at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And it's like taking your blanket, eating your dinner, watching that movie, that community experience of it. And it's less about it's just about experiencing cinema the way with a group of people. And that to me is how you, you raise a cinephile is make them fall in love with the experience of movie going, not specific films so much, but the experience of going and that communal, like I remember taking her to see purple rain at Hollywood forever. And this was after Prince died and quest love was DJing at the end. So like right when the movie ended quest love starts playing, let's go crazy by Prince. And everyone was up dancing that's an, obviously an, a very elevated cinema experience, but it's an experience no less. Yeah. And as today's film go, like the movie going experience today is about those secondary experiences that go along with the actually seeing the movie, whether it's pop ups or like it's yeah. these kind of experiential marketing is huge now. Yeah, I'm nervous that by the time he's in high school, movies are only going to be in museums. I think. Movies are too expensive for teenagers to go. They blow their whole allowance to be able to go to the theater. The movies that are on Netflix are the John Hughes films that we saw in theaters. They're not going to theaters because 
their audience is easier reached on TVs, but it's not better. And I'm like, no. I personally like want to convince Netflix and their theaters to do more like five dollar matinees of their teen rom coms and stuff at after school hour so kids can go and have that communal social because we're not social and outside and together and all of that but look i took my daughter and her, and her friend at the time to the new beverly to see a double bill of i think it was 16 candles and the breakfast club so it was like Did a john like Hughes it? double and so they loved it it okay. was great I get the fear of what's it going to be, but you'll know when you get there. And even if it's, look, you, again, you can, if it's rooted in something like positive and nurturing, like setting up a screen in your backyard and that's your movie night. Because remember when we grew up, we didn't have 80 inch TVs and amazing surround sound in our home. Mm-hmm. So to really look at, I love the movie going experience. But I can also, like, I do a movie night for my birthday every year now. And, like, I set up my big screen outside when I get popcorn and concessions. And I make an experience of it. And I think you can create that. And I think if they see the pleasure that it brings you, and then they'll they'll find their way with all that stuff. And kind of hear where you're coming from. I look at, like, the way my daughter works on films now and just how those films are marketed and put out. And really, again, like I said, like, it's all about social media content. And it's just such a different experience from what I grew up with. doesn't mean it's wrong or bad. It's just different. And that's what getting older is about. There are the things that we do connect on and whether it's music or films. And there's things that I'm like, no, thanks. I'm good. I have no interest in that. I'm really happy with who my daughter has evolved into. And I think that comes from good parenting is about giving context to things lending language to things. And it's one thing if you're just like throwing them in front of a TV and using that as a distraction. But if you're engaging about it and you make it fun and you make it like, this is the movie that I really loved when I was a kid. And even if they don't like it, like that's okay too. You never want to turn it into a negative. It's uh, it's like even her not liking Die Hard. Like I bet you in 10 years, you'll like that movie. There's movies that I didn't like at first that five years later, I'm like, oh, that's a really good movie. So I think it's just I don't know. It's the journey, right? Definitely. Yeah. And I think <laughs> there is a movie for everyone, right? Sure. All right. So my last question, because I know we're kind of out of time, the movie that I should show my son so that he falls in love with movies. Oh, man. I don't think there's really an answer to that, is there? Again, it's like these, it's like a huge, wide-ranging scope. I think you'd have to give me – I think you should – I think when you ask that question, you should give an age. I can say, oh, at age 13, he should, but if you have, you should say at what age should he, what should he watch at this age? And then I could probably give a recommendation, you know, but. I feel like it depends on the person I'm speaking with. Some people think yeah. to get them to fall in love with cinema, it's a young thing. And some people think it's a, with that moment that made them want to work in the industry and other people that's think. That's the thing. Yeah. But that's, that's a- the thing. It's like the shining, as we know, like the shining was age 15 for my daughter. That made yeah. her, I think realize that movies can work, operate on this incredible level. But just the experience of enjoying a movie and just like being taken over by it, that all happens at a young age. I'm just trying to think what's a good movie to show. I want to think when he's like younger, what's a good one that he'll get a kick out of. How about I'll rephrase it. What is one movie I should definitely make sure I show him? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like I can't leave off the list. That's another way. It's the same idea. So it doesn't have to be the yeah. one and only, but the like I one know. that you think I should like, if I'm making a list from this show from every guest, which is what is one movie that I absolutely cannot forget to put on it. There are multiple movies. So I just got to think of a really good one that like, to me, I think honestly, if when he's at the age where he can handle a scary movie, the original Poltergeist. That was 1982. That movie, it it holds up today. I, that's the key too. I think you have to look back at movies that maybe you loved when you were younger, but they have to still hold up. And I watched mm-hmm. Poltergeist recently and that holds up. And I think it's just the right balance of scary, but has some lightheartedness to it. When he's enjoying like scary movies, got to show him Poltergeist. Okay. That's the beginning his journey into the genre of horror. It's a good one. It definitely is because mm-hmm. you got Carol Ann getting sucked into the TV. You got the clown attacking the brother. You've got <laughs> Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams. You've got the, oh, there's so much good stuff in that movie. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Part of the excitement of this is that I get to rewatch all these movies, hopefully. And so I'm like, maybe even twice, one before I show him and one with him. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm equally as excited to read all the books in his curriculum at school. <laughs> so I'm like, I like just can't wait to revisit all of this amazing storytelling with him. I think since you like horror movies and you and if you really want to expose him, whatever the right age is going to be, it's like you want to choose horror films that have very strong stories at their core. There was that trend of that kind of horror porn era, like mm. Hostel and these really like I look, I enjoy Saw movies, but they're very intense. I think you want to find those horror films that really live in a human world. Mm. Stranger Things does that a little bit. That's why I, I like Poltergeist a lot, because to me, there's a very human family st- family story there. Yeah. So yeah, that I might feel help. like Str- Stranger Things is a great gateway to the like, 80s horror, right? Yeah, it's like, for sure. It has today's feeling with it, but it's in that time period, so it would feel more natural. What the Duffer brothers did with that, just in terms of the, even like everything from, forget David Harbour's character name, but like the truck he drove is like basically Roy Scheider's truck from Jaws. They so curated the look of that show to invoke nostalgia that Mm -hmm. it just made me want to seek it all out again. Yeah, I'm so curious how like a 14, 15 year old feels about that show. Because I know from my peers, we had that nostalgia pull into it and then the story was fun. And Yeah, but look at what that show does. It introduced kids to Kate Bush. This last season, like that song, it was almost like the show was saying to your kids, hey, check out this cool old song. And it became like a TikTok thing. And Running Up That Hill by Kate Bush had a whole resurgence. So yeah. it's helping introduce your kid to, if he watches that show, it, it's helping introduce them to things. And like I think I said early on, like a kid's instinct sometimes is going to be to push back and be like, don't tell me what to like. So sometimes knowing good resources for them to watch will do it for you. Mean and get them into stuff that you would have liked to, but at least they got, at least they found their way there somehow. Yeah, for sure. Greg, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful conversation. It's so interesting, and you really know your cinema. So thank you so much. Oh man, I could keep talking for hours, but I will not. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to end this podcast. No, but thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure. And I, again, any opportunity to, to talk about movies, I, I love it. If you enjoyed the conversation, please don't forget to like and subscribe. New episodes release every Wednesday. And leave a comment and let me know which movie you think I should show my son. Until next time, take care.